All right, so hey everyone, uh, my name is Jedi Weller. Uh, as Deanna said, I am the CEO and founder of OpenForge, and we are here today to talk about a very, very exciting uh, topic, which is building mobile games with a combination of Ionic and Phaser, right? Uh, so what I saw from the poll results here that it looks like you know we're kind of a little bit split between a, a multiplayer, uh, the Candy Crush type games, the Clash Clans type games, um, you know, and uh, if you guys are, you know, software developers, you know, statistically, we generally enjoy video games. So it's a really exciting topic uh, for us um, and an exciting topic for me because I actually learned software development uh, from video games as well. So we're going to be talking about all that. A uh, quick interesting note in case you guys uh, don't know the business model behind uh, mobile games. Uh, if you want to know what Candy Crush made in revenue in just one year alone in 2020, it was about, uh, I think it was what, uh, 11, well, one, 1,190 million, that's what it was. So uh, a lot of revenue can be made from mobile games. And that's another reason why we're so passionate about this. All right, so like I said, we are gonna talk about Ionic and Phaser. Why on earth would we combine these two beautiful technologies? Uh, how does it help us with mobile applications and mobile games? And uh, we're gonna show you exactly how. Uh, we actually have a open source repository that we've made just for you. Uh, as part of this uh, webinar and as part of this presentation, um, we have some live uh, code examples. Uh, we're literally going to get in the weeds here. So uh, very excited about that. And just to give you a quick preview uh, of you know, what a game could look like, uh, this is actually a game that we've built. It's for a company we own called Startup Wars. And this is using Ionic and Phaser. And as you can see, uh, there is no limitation to what you can do uh, with Ionic and Phaser. Uh, it is a, a, a great combination of technologies. Uh, we've been trusted partners with Ionic. I mean, we've been using Ionic since Alpha. Uh, it was uh, eight years ago, I think it was. And, uh, and Phaser is a technology that we just started adopting, I'd say probably like three years ago, uh, three or four years ago, and we've just loved it. So uh, again, very excited for this. So just real quick introductions uh, for myself and I'll let Ricardo uh, you know, introduce himself. Uh, so, you know, I'm a software developer by trade. I started coding when I was about, you know, I think it was like 1998. I was about probably 10 years old. And uh, I started coding because of a video game called Tribes 2. And if anyone remembers Tribes 2, it was a first person shooter. And in order to have your own like guild or your clan page in Tribes, uh, you had to actually code it in HTML and CSS. So uh, that's, I wanted to have my own guild. So I started learning. Uh, I was from the country, uh, you know, like Amish country. And so, you know, no one around me was into computers or technology, um, but I was super into video games and, and that's how I learned my entire career, okay? Uh, now I run OpenForge, OpenForge Enterprises, and also uh, Startup Wars. And we also invest in some mobile application-based businesses as well from the parent company. Um, you know, I talk about uh, both uh, technology from a, uh, uh, from a developer perspective, and I also speak about uh, startups and starting businesses and founder stories uh, all across the world. So uh, that's what I'm excited about. That's what I'm into. Uh, and we have the fabulous, wonderful Mr. Ricardo. Ricardo, I'll let you introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Jedi. So uh, hello, my, my name is Ricardo Madrid. I'm from Honduras. Uh, I don't have any broken <laughs> um, bones as Jedi. I have zero, but yeah, it's a fun fact for me. Um, yeah, I, I am a, a software, senior software engineering and mobile specialist uh, uh, here at Ionic. Um, yeah, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here to, to present this, this webinar with Jedi. Awesome. Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah, it's, it's so good to have you. Uh, Ricardo uh, is a newer member of our team uh, for maybe like a year or so now, and you know, just, just absolutely super skilled in Ionic and mobile development. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, you know, please, Ricardo is the go-to. Uh, I also saw a question from the audience from Philip. Uh, what phaser, version of phaser are we gonna be using? Uh, we're using the latest version, version three. So uh, this, this demonstration will be based on the latest. All right, awesome. And I cannot give any presentation without introducing our team. Uh, the OpenForge team, we specialize in mobile applications, right? So, uh, you know, we, uh, we just love mobile. You can see from our logo, I don't know if you can see the hoodie or in the background, mobile is all we do. So we're very, very passionate about it. Um, you know, we have about 24 million users across the uh, United States uh, for all the different apps that we built. And yeah, mobile is where it's at. 
right? Everything is going mobile. Um, you know, this is our specialty. I'm not going to bore you guys with too much about the company. If you want to learn more about us, uh, please go to openforge.io uh, and you can totally learn more. This conversation is about Ionic and Phaser. So let's dive in. A quick look at our agenda, just from a high level view, okay? Uh, we're going to be talking about why Ionic and Phaser is a combination, uh, how it can uh, benefit from a productivity perspective and utilizing your existing web development skills. Uh, we're going to show you actually how to integrate Ionic and Phaser together. Uh, we will talk a little bit about performance and some uh, very important caveats that you, uh, if you maybe tried the combination on your own you, and you said, oh my God, my computer is exploding. Uh, there's probably a reason for that and we're, we'll show you why. Uh, and then also uh, we'll talk a little bit about game architecture, uh, really going to focus on class instantiation, right? And specifically with TypeScript. Uh, and then, yeah, we'll kind of look over a step-by-step -step guide together. So that is the general agenda. Did I miss anything from that, uh, Ricardo? No, I think we're good. Okay, beautiful. Awesome. So, all right, let's start out by just doing a, a high level benefits of Phaser. So Phaser, what is it? It is a JavaScript slash TypeScript uh, technology, a library for building out 2D games. Now, it is very much like Ionic in the sense that it is uh, free and uh, open source. It is uh, fully extendable, uh, you know, so you can write custom plugins for it. You can really customize it in any way that you want to. And it, the, the two most important pieces here are that Phaser has all, already created a lot of the logic, actually, basically all the logic you'll ever need for actually putting in animations, putting in like transitions, uh, dealing with uh, sprites and characters and graphics. Uh, all of that is already included in the actual library. And same with uh, stuff that's very common in games, uh, such as like physics engines, you know, like handling velocity, handling uh, collision points, um, you know, uh, detecting, you know, where an object is in, in space. Uh, all of this is in the library and they have really good documentation as well. Uh, so highly recommend, you know, kind of reading through their documentation. Um, now, how does that, how does that kind of compare against Ionic? Well, Ionic is also free and open source, right? Uh, and one of the best things about Ionic that I know is one of the reasons that we use it exclusively, right? We, we really, whenever we're doing any mobile application, uh, we don't even bother using any other type of technology is the, is primarily the code reuse. So, you know, if any of you have, have, uh, developed like an application with maybe, uh, with maybe like react, right. You know, or react native, uh, you know, you, you'll often hear about code reuse and say, oh yeah, you, well, you, have to, you can build it once, but you know, it can be, uh, reused across everything. And that applies, you know, for what we found, maybe like 80, 90%, uh, but generally you still have to make these modifications. Uh, in our experience with Ionic, you really don't have to do any changes from different devices. And that's super important uh, for any application lifecycle, right? Um, the other thing is adaptive styling, right? Uh, and, you know, the support from many different technologies. So obviously at this point, Ionic supports Angular, React, and Vue, which is really cool. Um, and then if you are, if you're offering an enterprise like solution, uh, which many of our customers are, then they, you know, Ionic does have a lot of SaaS based products and subscription products for stuff like AppFlow, right? You know, which allows you to just get to market faster. They provide enterprise support. Uh, it's, it's really beneficial, right? And not only is it really beneficial, it saves you time. And I'm sure you all know that time is the biggest thing. And that's, that's one of the, the key focus points of both Phaser and Ionic here is that these are libraries where the teams that built them they have put in the time, they put in the effort, right? And so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And that's like the most important critical piece, right? Uh, anything I missed there, Ricardo? No, uh, just uh, saying that uh, some people are, are, are asking us how, how version of, of Phaser we are, we are, we are working on. And we, we, are, we are working on uh, Phaser 3. So just a little comment here. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. And actually, and uh, I think is our Angular version for this presentation. Are we using thirteen? Yeah, thirteen. Yeah, okay, thirteen. Yeah, so 
Angular 13. Go ahead. Yeah, Sorry. Uh, Ionic 6, by the way. And Ionic 6. Yep. Beautiful. All right. Cool. So we talked about what Ionic is separately and what Phaser is separately. So why would we use them together? Right. And this is the most important high level concept of this presentation. When you are developing any mobile application, okay, there is going to be a, there's a lot of functionality that is going to be common between any different type of application. So whether you're building a dating app like Tinder or whether you're building a game like Candy Crush, you're going to have authentication. You know, you're going to have the splash screen, you're going to have the register screen, you're going to have the login screen, social, you know, social login with Facebook, Google, you name it, right? You're going to have a settings page. You're going to have a user profile page, right? All that. Well, as a quick example, to, get, to build that in Ionic, like let's say just the registration flow, I don't know, uh, eight to 16 hours, probably like an entire registration flow. Is it, you think that's a fair estimate, Ricardo? Yeah, it's, it's okay. Um, and and it, it's more easy if, you, if you're if you using like Firebase as as your backend provider, uh, it's pretty much easier to, to, to uh, do not waste time, uh, like you say, inventing the wheel. <laughs> exactly, right? Because, you know, all like every app needs some sort of version of, you know, authentication and the flow is basically the same. Now, if you build that flow with Ionic, you're looking at a day or two, okay? Now, obviously, if you have some complex backend logic, it might take you longer, but for the front end, you know, component side of it, it's a day or two. And that means it's a day or two, including supporting all the different mobile phones, whether it's an iPhone SE, an iPhone, you know, 10, 13, you know, a Samsung Galaxy, a Note, uh, you know, a Flip. It doesn't matter what it is because again, Ionic as a, front end UI library has already done the work of making sure that their components are automatically responsive for all the different screen sizes. If you did that same flow in phaser, it would take you a week plus, right? Because you're now gonna be custom, you know, if, the way phaser works, you're, you, it's, it really relies on, um, you know, on the actual game assets, which are gonna be like, you know, custom created assets for you. So it does not provide that, that UI library. And that's an important difference here, okay? So, and, if, and if, we, if we go the reverse aspect and we say, okay, well, what's Phaser good at, right? Well, Phaser, you know, we can, we can add an image or add an animation or a sprite in Phaser in like three seconds. It would take a lot longer in Ionic. And I think we actually tried it once um, and we did it after a long while, but, it had major performance issues, right? You know, it had, it was, it was not a pretty implementation. Uh, you know, it's just not as easy because Ionic wasn't built for games alone and Phaser wasn't built for business logic alone, right? So that's the core concept here of combining these two technologies together, right? Is that Ionic is great for the business presentation. And when you are building an, an, a mobile app with Ionic and Ionic UI components, you can very quickly get to market and that would allow you extra time to work on your actual game mechanics, right? Which are going to take you longer, but they're going to be a lot quicker in phaser. Okay. So I hope that makes sense to everyone. If anyone has any questions about that, you know, feel free to, to post them. All right, cool. So I think right here is where we are going to jump into the, the code. So let's get in. I'm going to try to exit this and come into our repo. So uh, very first thing. So we're going to dive in. We're going to be talking about, uh, the, you know, we're going to go through the actual repository. Uh, first things first, just to give you guys an idea. And if you are at your computer and not riding a roller coaster at Disney, uh, like the, the one person is, then uh, you can actually go to our repo here, uh, github.com slash openforge. We have two templates that are going to be I think pretty important uh, for this conversation. We have a Ionic mono repo template. Now this one is just a standard Ionic application in a, in a NX mono repo. And we use this as the basis for this template, the Ionic phaser game template. So the Ionic phaser game template is the one that we're gonna be using in this conversation. Um, obviously if you 
want to just create an Ionic app and you want to use a mono repo structure, you can use this one. If you want to do it with both uh, Ionic and Phaser, you can use this one here. So feel free to uh, you know, clone this and follow along. Uh, the easiest way if you've never used a template before from GitHub is just click use this template and it allows you to create your own repository. Um, if you do like this, please, we just launched this for this webinar. Uh, so we literally just finished it up this morning, I think it was, right, Ricardo? And uh, so if you do like this, please give us a star. Uh, and if you have any issues that you run across, you know, just you know, create an issue in GitHub. As developers, you know that the whole nine yards here, so we don't need to go too in depth. So that is what we are go uh, going to show here. And, and Deanna, just to, because I can't really see how easy it is to see the screen, or I guess for the audience, can you guys see this okay? If I, if I have it at this uh, at this Zoom level, yeah. Okay, beautiful. Looks good. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, so just some really important things. Whenever uh, you know we're instructing anyone on creating a mobile application or just an application of any type, uh, I always want to start with process enforcement. Right. I know it's not the topic of this conversation but it is so worthwhile just spending like three minutes talking about it, okay? Uh, so first things first, we are using a Narwhal's you know, NX mono repo structure. So the structure and some of the different configurations in here, you'll see are from that. We have a workspace.json, we have an nx.json, okay? Uh, we still have our package JSON. Uh, you know, this is a uh, Angular application. We're using Angular here. Um, and then we have a couple of things. So let me, let me see, let me scroll up, down. All right, so in this, we have already configured uh, ESLint and we also have Prettier already configured, right? So if you are uh, using this as a template, you will probably save, I don't know, maybe like 20 to 30 hours of time uh, just configuring all this different stuff that we have set up here. Um, it, does, it does auto lint on save. Uh, it does, um, it will, you know, give us some, uh, some warnings and some errors. So, you know, just keep that in mind. And you might not be used to this. And when, a lot of times when, when uh, people, you know, uh, uh, hire us to help out, you know, their development team or help out their team, uh, you know, we'll find a lot of issues are often caused by not having these type of standards in place. Um, you know, stuff like how to use a promise properly, right, you know, between different versions of TypeScript and JavaScript, uh, you know, it's, you can either try to remember every single rule there is for how to use TypeScript, or you can just hook up ESLint uh, and it tells you a lot of this stuff, right? So it's a much better approach there. Uh, let's see, and I think, so that's package JSON, uh, Prettier and ESLint. I think that's, most of the ones that we have set up here. Is that right, uh, Ricardo? Do we have any other ones for this repository? Let me see here. Oh yeah, and here, this is the last piece. Uh, we have the pre-commit and uh, pre-push for Husky. So basically it just makes sure that everything is linted before you push and everything is built. And then on pre-commit, it just does the NPX lint. So uh, that's important. Uh, also, depending on the size of your application, this application we're showing you is not gonna need this, but sometimes when you're hooking up to CI CD, you're gonna need to increase your uh, you know, maximum um, space for node. That way your application can run. Uh, if you don't have this, sometimes it will just like crash and give you a, an error. So uh, we have that implemented as well. Yeah, and okay. yeah. Uh, yep. it, it to mention that uh, these steps are very, uh, as these steps are very important to to have a good standard on on our repos because uh, we we are like um, avoiding some uh, like errors that uh, sometimes we we are we have in the code in the code uh, before that before following some standards of of, of programming so uh, it's it's really important uh, that's why we have uh, those those line of code to verify before. Uh, commit uh, 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 to GitHub. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. And uh, also I, I just saw a, a question, a couple of questions here. Um, one from Bob, 
is what benefits are there to using Ionic as opposed to just using your favorite JS framework um, with capacitor and phaser? Uh, it's a really good question. You know, it's mostly related to the UI library as well as some of the support that they provide. Uh, you know, we found that using AppFlow, for instance, it, it, will, it will save over the course of a year, if you have a full development cycle, it will save like a month worth of developer time um, just going through that process. It's, it's really, really nice. Uh, and then same with the UI library. The UI library is, you know, specific for mobile, uh, whereas Angular's or, you know, Google Material is, it's not, right? You know, so it's, uh, they, they are responsive, but it's not hyper-focused. And whenever we've, you know, whenever you find a technology or just any product that, uh, that hyper-focuses on one thing, there's generally going to be better at that one thing than one that, you know, is more abstract. So I hope that answers that question. And then I'm just going to... Uh, do, 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 Lots do. of great questions coming yeah. in. Thank you, everybody. Keep them coming. Yeah. Um, so for DartPit, uh, yes, you can totally upgrade from Ionic 3 to Ionic 6. And uh, Deanna, maybe you'd be actually better to, you know, like maybe there's a, a link or a resource you could put in the chat uh, to, you know, for a guide, because there's a lot of guides out there, DartPit, for, you know, how to upgrade. Um, Absolutely. And then, so I just answered that one. Hey, you guys are full of questions. I love it. This is awesome. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, and since I'm a beginner, what do you advise me to start with, Angular, Vue, or, or React? Uh, Ricardo, why don't you answer this one? Yeah. Um, uh, it's a really good question. Uh, it's, it depends of, of how, uh, how, how you manage your, the, the language. Uh, but I think that Angular is is the best way to to start because Angular has a, a more solid documentation and 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 yeah you, you can follow uh, you, you can follow the, the the steps to 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 start with Angular and yeah I, I think that the best uh, the best way to start is is with Angular. Awesome. All right. Cool. And I know there's a lot of more questions, uh, but let's we're just gonna get through a little bit more and then hopefully we'll answer some of these questions, um, but we will we promise to get through them all. All right, beautiful. So let's uh, start out by uh, just looking at the overall structure of the repository. So if you haven't used a mono repo before, uh, basically the whole concept is that everything is in one place. And this allows you to really, really organize your code and make it so that multiple different applications can use the same code base, okay? So in this example, uh, we have our example app and our example app E to E, right? So that's the one that we're actually gonna be uh, using for this. Um, and we also have a libs directory. Now the libs directory has two folders under it. It has example app and then it has shared, all right? So the idea here, is that anything that is, is specifically a library for this example app would be under here. And we have this broken out between Ionic and Phaser, okay? And then anything that's shared across all of the different apps that might use this mono repo would be under the shared repo. So give you an example of this. We have our classes defined uh, under data access model. Right. And this basically means that if we were, let's say we called this game that we're going to show you, you know, uh, the forge. Okay. And it's all about, you know, creating a, like a blacksmith creating swords. Well, maybe we wanted to create a second game, the forge 2.0. Right. And we didn't like, we wanted to create a new app for it because it's a different game, but we don't want to recreate all the work that we've done. Well, we don't have to, we can just import, all of our classes from the shared uh, data access model, and it would allow us to use them in both applications. And that's a really important piece. Uh, okay, cool. Oh, and you know what I should do here is we should probably show you guys what we are actually uh, looking at. So this is the application that we are looking at, okay? So we have a Ionic application with Phaser here. Uh, we have a little blacksmith and his, and, and his forge. And yeah, this part right here is using phaser. So the way, the way that we have found has been best to kind of combine the two uh, technologies from like a user experience standpoint is to have Ionic be responsible for most of the navigation and business side. So in this example here, 
we have the Ionic menu, and I'm going to show you guys just the implementation of this. Uh, there's, by the way, there's no rhyme or reason to, well, there is some rhyme or reason, but there's no specific rhyme or reason uh, to the order in which we're going to show this to you. Uh, so basically what we're doing is kind of just basing it on what's a topic of conversation based on your questions at the time. So uh, if we go to the homepage here, so we are currently on the homepage in our Ionic app. We can see this by localhost slash home. And we have just very standard Ionic uh, components here. So we have Ionic Ion header, an Ion toolbar, <clears throat> Ion buttons, uh, Ion menu button, and the home page, and that's it, right? There is nothing in this Ion content. And the reason for that is normally Ion content would display right here, okay? Because this is the home page but we have this being filled in with phaser, okay? So this class, this div right here is very important. The way phaser works, and I'm gonna show this to you here. Do, do, do. I'm gonna go to our singleton of phaser. And here it is. So basically what happens in this application is when the application loads, we have, we, the very first thing that we do is we instantiate our phaser singleton service. So if you've never created a singleton before with Angular, it's very, very easy. Uh, Angular doc goes, uh, documentation goes super into it. But essentially what this means is a singleton is a, it's, it's almost like a global variable, right? And so I know that, you know, global variables in, uh, as a rule are generally a bad thing, right? However, it is very useful especially in, a, in game applications, game development, to have one single source of truth, right? That can uh, handle different parts of the application re revolving around state management. So for us, we have our phaser singleton service, which is responsible for storing the active game that's currently going on in phaser, okay? Uh, it has ng zone, and we'll talk about ng zone in a second. It has the actions history, so actions history, we, we created this as a log to make this easy to show everyone. And it's just gonna be every, like the actions that are taken uh, as we're playing. And then we have a shop observable. So this is part of the state management piece that I was referring to. Uh, and we found that this is one of the best ways that we found to do this. Uh, if you wanted to make sure that across different pages within your Ionic application, you know, if you're going through the the life cycle, uh, the Angular life cycle through init and destroy, right? Well, stuff is going to get lost. So this allows us to have one place that we can just centrally reference. All right. So what, and we'll talk more about that in a second. So uh, the constructor for the phaser singleton module uh, is pretty straightforward. If it already exists, so if the parent module exists, then we error it out because there should only ever be one instance of a singleton. Uh, and then we are initializing the ng zone, okay? So what does the ng zone mean? Let me go down here to this. All right. So this part is very important. And it actually, you know, when we first combine Ionic and Angular together, uh, we did not run it outside of the Angular zone. Uh, and essentially what this means is that when Angular is going through its normal life cycle, it's looking for data updates, right? You know, within its pages. And then if it finds an update, you know, it re-renders everything. You know, that's kind of like how it works. Well, if phaser, oh, and I'm sorry, and phaser separately, phaser also does the same thing. So phaser, but the way phaser does it is it goes through many, many times a second and calls an update function. Right. And so that update function, I think, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think it's like 60 uh, ticks per second to kind of emulate 60 frames per second. So when you have the combination of phaser running 60 times a second, right, inside, inside of Angular, right, which every time it detects a, a child changing, it also re-renders everything. You basically just get into this loop of non-stop rendering and uh, when we first did this and we were running uh, it even locally on our computer, we, occasionally our computer would literally crash and we couldn't figure out why. 
And then, so we started looking at the performance and we could actually see the lifecycle uh, hooks. And then we realized, oh, wow, we need to run these completely separately. So phaser is a very, uh, it, it must be run outside of Angular. If it is not, then you're going to, to trigger multiple lifecycle hooks. Okay, very, very important. All right, <clears throat> then in order to instantiate phaser, we do this here. If, the, if an active game does not exist, we come in here and we say phaser is equal to new phaser game. So this game takes in a configuration. It talks about the scale, right? So we have phaser resizing here. Uh, we set the width and the height to the, uh, the window width and height. Uh, we have the parent. And this parent, if we do a search all for this, this is what I was showing you in the homepage. So basically what phaser does is when it creates this new game, it looks for a div with an ID called forge-main, right? You can name this whatever you want. Uh, this is just what we named it, right? And so this div must exist. Otherwise, when phaser, when the game engine starts, it's going to error out because it says, oh, there is no div for me to exist in, okay? Oh, and Mark, uh, Mark Stutz, I just saw uh, Mark said, uh, brilliant, I discovered the crash, not what causes it. Hey, thank you, you are absolutely welcome, Mark. I am glad. I can tell you that when we were first experimenting with this technology, uh, we were looking at like the architecture between the two. I can tell you, I spent at least 40 hours, uh, if not more, and uh, you know, like Ricardo, Maria Jose, uh, you know, like our entire team, we were all banging our heads on this. So don't feel bad. This is one that you that is just a very difficult one. And it's, it's so funny because it's like one line of code to fix it, <laughs> but many, many hours to diagnose. <laughs> I see he says me too. Uh, awesome. Okay, uh, let me see. Anything else, Ricardo, you could, that we should touch on regarding the phaser instantiation or from the audience? Um, I think we're good. Awesome, okay, cool, beautiful. All right, so let's see here. So when the homepage initializes, we are going to instantiate uh, the, our singleton service and then we call init, right? And, oh yeah, init is the function that we just went over here. So that's, that's kind of how the homepage uh, is generated. So let's see, let's talk, oh, let's talk about just like resizing uh, for a second. So obviously Ionic, automatically handles you know, responsive design and so does phaser, right? So when we have this phaser scale dot resize in here, right? This is kind of what allows us to resize based upon the screen window. Uh, and if we pull up, I'm just gonna pull up our console log here so we can see this live in action. Cool. Yep. So I have just a console log that just prints the resize and it might be a little small, but if you can see every time we're resizing it, it's just basically taking in the new size of the device. So uh, it doesn't matter what the size is, it still works. So we can put it in a mobile view and it will still work perfectly. Um, also, this is on the Ionic side. Let me go back to Ionic here. Do, 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 do on our app.component.html. So in you know, the primary app component, this left side is an ion menu and it's in an ion split pane container, right? So basically what we're doing here is we are splitting the application and we're saying there's a left side, there's a right side, right? When we are in this smaller mobile view, the left side hides, but you can click the uh, the burger menu to pop it out. Um, and then when we're in the larger view, it's automatically you know, popped out there. So the nice thing, and again, the nice part about the combination of technologies here is that this would be a lot of work uh, to implement in phaser. It took three seconds in Ionic, right? And a big shout out to Paulina, uh, one of our team members. So she was the one who implemented this piece for us. Uh, so always wanna give credit where credit is due. All right. So dun, 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 dun. let's see, we got our three buttons here. So we have go to homepage, open shop modal, 
and go to shop page. So let's talk about that for a second. Let's take a look at this. So, when, oh, actually here first, let's, let's go ahead and uh, create a cheap sword. So our cheap sword, we click it, the blacksmith is working here. And then we can see after he's finished, the sword is created and uh, he is done working. So he goes to an aisle state. Again, if you didn't see that, we click this, he starts working. And then after a couple of seconds, the sword, a second sword is created. Okay, so we know that we can, you know, uh, do this asynchronously. So let us dive into the actual class itself. And I'm going to go to our data access model here. I'm going to exit this to clean up. And we're going to go here. Okay, so uh, the big thing about game development is most game development is using some sort of object only object oriented approach. Okay, so we've tried to set that up a very, very basic uh, example for you guys, uh, because, you know, we just want to kind of like, you know, showcase it. Uh, so we have a human class here. Uh, that human just has a name, uh, a constructor, and uh, a build function. Uh, the blacksmith himself is a human, right? And he is also a sprite. So basically, we're extending the phaser game object sprite and implementing our human class here. So can we have a asynchronous constructor? Let's see. No. It's erring. Why is it erring? Async modifier cannot appear on constructor declaration. Okay, so we cannot do that. So uh, if you if you thought that you could, you cannot. And so you might be thinking, oh no, well we can't do this. We can't do this asynchronously. How are we going to actually instantiate a class if we can't construct it asynchronously? Some languages do allow you to do this. Well, fear not, there is a solution. Uh, it is almost like a workaround. So what we can do here, and actually I'm going to go to the sword class because the sword class is the one that we are uh, creating here. We did the same thing. We just had uh, the parent class sword, and then we have a cheap sword and a fancy sword. So let's go into the cheap sword. So our constructor is just a normal constructor, right? We have, uh, we're passing in the phaser scene. Uh, we have to pass this in because we need to be able to add the object to the phaser scene, right? Um, we can see here that it's, we're calling super class, that this is again, part of the phaser implementation when we extend the phaser game objects image uh, because our class is both what we make of it and it is a phaser uh, image. You can do this a different way. You can make it so that you can instantiate your own class and then have a reference to the phaser like image or phaser uh, animation or sprite that you're doing. Uh, I, we actually did that for one of our applications. We did that approach initially, but lately we've been leaning towards having it just all be in one class. That way you don't have to maintain references, right? It's a little bit easier. Uh, and then we're gonna set the sword type and that's it, right? So this is just a normal constructor. Okay, nothing special here, but that is not asynchronous. So how do we make it asynchronous? Well, what we can do is we can actually create a build function, right? And a build function is just basically a regular function, right? It's a static one, so that exists on every sword type. And this function can be asynchronous, right? So how do we make it async? First, we just instantiate or we construct a new cheap sword. So this instantly is uh, calling this constructor for this class and it is putting it on this temporary object. That does not happen asynchronously, okay? Again, uh, that is just you know, going straight. However, we can force it to then wait before we consider this object uh, completed or returned, right? And then uh, we can do that by putting in a wait, new, promise, uh, set timeout, resolve, right? And, you know, basically just, we just have an asynchronous function in here to just you know, cause it to, to take a little extra time. Uh, then after we get that object, then we are going to add it to phaser. Uh, we set the scale here, right? And then we set to visible. Uh, what happens if we don't, uh, just to show you guys what the scale is here, I'm going to save this, refresh, go here, purchase. All right. So the scale literally just increases the size. Uh, so 
nice and easy. That's what the scale is. And setting it visible just makes it obviously visible. Uh, Ricardo put a nice uh, uh, rotation logic in here to make sure that when we create multiple of these, each time we do it, it's going to create another one, right? And it's going to be in a different uh, like rotation, so we can just see uh, that they are, you know, that there's multiple ones existing. See like that. All right, beautiful. And then and then we return the object. Okay, so this basically is taking our constructor and it's saying, okay, you know what? Uh, we, we have this object, but we're not actually gonna return it until after we've waited for certain things to happen. So this can be useful if you have to, you know, maybe pull data from your server. This can be useful if you're, you know, doing some sort of logic other places in your application. Um, if you don't do this, you may run into a race condition, right? You may try to use an object before it's actually instantiated. And uh, when we were first, when we first started with this and we first started with this game development, uh, we, we actually were doing that, right? And we didn't even see that, that the objects were not being instantiated in the correct order because generally it's so quick, right? If you're not, wait, if you're not actually waiting for anything and a lot, we had a lot of stuff actually instantiating in the very beginning of the application. But remember when you're building a mobile app and this is you know, kind of key, uh, the mobile experience is a huge indicator on how your app is going to succeed. So if you have a very, very long initial loading time because you're instantiating everything, right? Um, then two things can happen. One, you are gonna see just statistically uh, higher drop-offs in people using your application, right? You know, there's an initial, there's an initial uh, statistic in the mobile app industry about how many people download the app versus then install it, right? Uh, and both of those have different drop-offs. And then once you, or, I'm sorry, and versus actually use it, right? So like log in. And then from logging in to, you know, loading the actual application, there's another drop-off point there. So there's a user experience side. Uh, there is, uh, there's also going to be a memory side. And I'm not sure, uh, yeah, I have some older phones here, but um, basically like if you're, if you're on an older device and we've run into this a couple of times, if you have very like large assets or you have a lot of stuff you're trying to load in memory all at once, you know, if someone's using an old iPhone, like an iPhone four, right? Or even an iPhone five, well, you might actually crash that device or crash your application on the device because you're going out of bounds of how much memory it has. So another advantage that you can uh, get here, right? Is you don't have to load everything in the very beginning. You can start loading stuff uh, with the actual class uh, creation throughout your application as is actually generated. So that provides a lot of benefit too. All right, cool. Uh, we see here. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Here, question that the, the, the audience asked. And I think that for this part, uh, we're gonna be able to, to answer. So one of the, the questions uh, that I think is very important is, is like uh, Paul uh, asked, why do you need the sort creation to be async? Oh yeah, awesome. So yes, the, the sort creation, the reason you would need it to be async, in this example, uh, let me see. Ah, here, I can, I can give you a perfect reason, actually, because we actually do have that. So when we click, create sword. I'm going to do a fancy sword because it takes longer. Oops. Our blacksmith is like, we're playing this animation. We don't want to uh, actually stop that animation or tell them to go idle again until the sword is created. Now we could use some sort of callback, right? Or a promise, but then what's going to happen is we're going to have a ton of promises, right? Like we're just gonna be like, we're gonna have a bunch of different listeners all throughout the application for every single type of class. And most games are going to have like 500 plus classes, right? So by doing it this way, we no longer have to build in like, like actual listener logic just for the uh, class to be instantiated or to be created. We literally are, are just calling a single line of code and that line of code would be in the blacksmith object here. So when we, uh, when we purchase the sword, and actually what we can do here is let me start from up top. 
So if we go into the shop component, we see here, we just have these two cards. So open a shop modal, two cards, and the purchase is just a button. So we go into purchase. And we can see here that what we do is we pass in a shop observable. So why do, I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna answer this question. I just wanna first take a second to show why we're doing this here. So we don't need a shop observable on this screen because we're still on phaser. And so it's just like a modal. But if you wanted to use Ionic Navigation to go back and forth between your, you know, your phaser uh, like instance where your game world is uh, and the rest of the application, and we wanted to pass this in, right? We would need to make sure that it, uh, the, the blacksmith knows about it, right? So when I click purchase here, basically what's happening is we're sending the, um, we're, we're basically shooting out to this shop observable which the blacksmith subscribes to. And we're saying, hey, you just got a new order, right? And then so in, once the blacksmith receives that, let's go here, blacksmith class, cool. So once the blast, blacksmith receives that, then he basically says, okay, if the sword type is a fancy one, I'm gonna build a fancy sword. Otherwise, if it's cheap, I'm gonna build a cheap sword. But here is basically the, you know, the, the answer to that question. Instead of having like a separate uh, subscription to wait for a sword to be created and to then like handle that one individually because it's a single instance, right? Instead, we can just say, hey, let the sword await for fancy sword dot build. Nice and easy. It's clean code. It, you know, allows you to, to, make sure that the actual object is created before you then do the next thing. And then you can see down here, when we go idle is this logic right here. So this dot play, and then we pass in the key of the blacksmith's um, you know, idle state. So there's nothing else that it's waiting for. If we didn't have this, if this class instantiation was not asynchronous, then as soon as, basically as soon as we click that button, he would start hammering and then he would stop hammering. And then three seconds later, the sword would be created. So that's why. Beautiful, yep, awesome. I'm just looking through. Yeah, is it, is it possible to create a multiplayer game, uh, a multi-platform game, iOS, Android, web using Ionic and Phaser? Yeah, ab actually, Absolutely. So uh, to give you a quick case study of, you know, like the real power of doing it this way is when we were first launching Startup Wars, which is, you know, again, one of our other companies, um, we went to market first with mobile and we built this, at, we built it as an Ionic and Phaser application and uh, we, we launched on mobile. We launched on iOS, uh, Android, Right, and those were our two things. And I might even be able to, to pull up, uh, let me see if I can pull up something here on this other screen. Uh, da, 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 startup Wars, there we go, here. So I'll give you an example here. So we launched this application first, just mobile, right? There's a whole nine yards. Then we realized, wow, our users are not, like, are not using it on mobile at all. They want web because we're selling to universities. So we then said, oh man, do we have to rebuild the entire application just to make it you know, web-based? Luckily the answer was no, right? What we did was we just shifted it and we shifted it to web, right? Because Ionic you know, is a web-based technology and you can automatically, it automatically supports PWAs. So that was easy. And then Phaser again is also a web-based technology. Uh, and so Phaser is actually specifically for web and the primary use case is web. Like, it's not necessarily mobile, but because it's running inside of, you know, Ionic and, Faith and Angular here, it, it can render just like anything else. So yeah, so it was super, super easy to actually just switch from iOS, Android to web, and we can still deploy whenever we want to iOS and Android and just, you know, launch it uh, as a native app on the app store. So yeah, very, very easy. And I hope that answered that question. We have a lot of questions here. Uh, da, 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 da. Let's see. How do you run Phaser outside of Angular? What would that look like? Uh, real quick, that's what the ng zone is. 
Um, earlier in the presentation, Andrew, uh, I had mentioned it, but I'll just bring it up here again really quick. It's this line of code right here. So if you go to our repository, that's where you're looking at. Oh, wow. And we are very, very close to time. So I am going to wrap us up here. Let me just see. Uh, is there anything else, Ricardo? Or, oh, I think we wanted to look at tips and tricks, right? Yeah, uh, we can run into a real kick. Uh, tips and tricks. So uh, uh, we are going to mention some some tips and, and, and tricks uh, uh, of what you can do with Ionic. So uh, first of all, uh, I, I want to mention that Ionic it's a great a great tool to build um, some to build mobile apps uh, faster. So uh, you can um, see that basically we, we, we have like uh, some uh, some questions of of if a uh, uh, native uh, uh, web based uh, progressive web based uh, how I can access to natives uh, uh, course of, of my of the mobile so uh, capacitor is a great and open source native tool uh, for for combining with Ionic and build native web web native apps uh, so capacitor allow, allow us to access to a big core natives apis and even create our own uh, we can pass to a simple web app to a native app in just seconds so what allows capacitor to us uh, we can access to the core native uh, APIs. We can uh, we we have a lab, uh, a big library of core native plugins. Uh, we have a great community uh, that develop plugins, and is easily to install and develop. So when we use Capacitor, we can access uh, like we are developing a native app. So uh, it's a great tool that we recommend to use. Uh, and, and it's a tool that is, uh, you know, uh, that is not like someone in the, in the chat say that Cordova is dead. No, Cordova is not dead, but Capacitor is a, um, a cross-platform name in runtime uh, by Ionic. So we have uh, the idea that uh, this, a uh, tool is is always at the at the uh, is always uh, will be the, the the same for Ionic. So uh, another Angular tick tip is that uh, we can destructor an object. Jedi, if you want to. Oh yeah, go to the next one. You got it. We can destruct an object uh, easily and assign to a uh, directly to a variable. So. What we are doing sometimes is like we declare a const a variable and await for the for the function, and then we can we call to the variable that we cannot that we want to assign uh, that uh, const that we declare uh, above, and simple for in a single line of code we can. Uh, Call the is admin, and then we can call the variable, and then we can await for the for the function response, and that's the way that we can structure an object easily. And we we are like uh, we are like saving a single uh, uh, a line of code. That saving line of code is always a good <laughs> a good uh, tip and trick. And then we, we are like another Angular tip. If, if you go into the next line, yeah, yeah, we can use this uh, single line to see what file we no the the, the other uh, yeah this one. We we use this single line to see what file we be generate. Uh, we have created them, so we we simple add dry run true to see what files we are going to generate uh, without creating them. So uh, that's, a, a, that's a good tip. And um, yeah, we have the other tip that we can add alias to our project instead of making uh, that, that 
slash dot dot slash to to get our component we can simplify this process by specifying the alias the aliases in our ts config.json so we can easily access uh, to that component when import in the ts config file so we name the 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 alias that we are going to to create and then we specify uh, to which folder with these aliases is listening to so uh, instead of yeah instead of use uh the dot dot slash dot dot slash we can we can do the company or whatever you 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 can name in the 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 aliases and then access to our to our components easily. yeah and that's really really useful especially if you guys do a lot of refactoring or you know you're changing things up in your application uh, that will save you a lot of uh, you know crazy amounts of line of code that you'll have to change um i, I know we've seen <laughs> we've definitely seen that in some of the applications we've done so yeah that's awesome so hey everyone i know we're a couple minutes over uh we're just going to do probably like three more minutes i want to touch base on a couple things um, and then I'm going to see about questions there. Oh, there are so many questions. This is a, a hot topic. You guys are awesome. Okay. So, uh, real quick, just a quick recap on the repository here, right? Again, this entire repository is available in, uh, our, as an open source repository, uh, just go to github.com slash open forge. And it's the ionic phaser game template. Uh, you know, there was a couple of questions about performance in the in the uh, comments here. So in terms of performance, so the, the performance limitation here would just be basically based upon, uh, you know, what phaser supports, right? And in terms of like, if you're trying to do like a first person shooter, or something like that, uh, I probably wouldn't use phaser for that, right? I would probably use something else. Uh, but Phaser is primarily focused on 2D games, you know, so, so we're looking at things that don't require a crazy frame rate and which is most games, right? You know, if we're looking at like Candy Crush, you know, Clash Clans, that kind of thing, uh, then Phaser is an awesome solution because you can do it a lot, you can build a game a lot quicker than you could in something like Unity, right? Also, you don't have the big license fees and that kind of thing. Uh, we do have an example here. It's a little bit older, so it's a little bit outdated. But this open farm puzzle game, uh, this one is like Candy Crush, right? So it's one of those, uh, you know, those, uh, what do you call it, match three puzzle games. Uh, so if you want to see how that's implemented, um, you know, you can totally check out this one. Like I said, we haven't updated this repository since 2020, so it is a little bit older. Uh, in terms of some of the people asking about, like, what would this look like in Vue.js? What would this look like in React? Uh, if that is something that you're interested in seeing, you know, please, uh, you know, add a comment here. So, you know, just, uh, you, you can either put in like a, uh, like a request, you can email us, uh, you can contact us however you'd like. Uh, you know, we, we basically build out stuff that the community asks for. And so if that's what something we want to see, then absolutely. Uh, so a couple quick, uh, yeah, quick kind of like closing uh, pieces. So we'll be emailing everyone, uh, just a quick follow-up. Uh, after the uh, after the conference, uh, just you know, as a thank you, we'll be providing the the copy of the slide deck. Uh, we'll be providing a link to the repository, uh, and you know, if there's anything else that's asked for and like the questions, uh, you know, that we can provide, we'll absolutely provide it. Um, one thing uh, to note here is if you do go to so later this week, we're going to be launching uh, the new version of our mobile academy. Uh, so if you are interested in you know, just like getting uh, updates like tips and tricks, uh, you know, get notif notified about mobile applications in general. Uh, we release a lot of content relating to the mobile application industry. It's not Ionic focused, it's not phaser focused, it's a combination of both plus the business side of mobile applications, right? So uh, definitely sign up here. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of different articles. This isn't live yet. So if you go to our uh, active website, you won't see this yet. It's gonna be launched, I think on Thursday or Friday, I'll have to, I'll have to check with the marketing team. Uh, but if you're watching this as a recording, obviously it's already going to be uh, up here. Uh, and then same with our YouTube channel. Uh, we do have a uh, video up on YouTube already uh, that goes a little bit in depth into creating a Ionic and Phaser game. 
And from these questions, we'll probably create a couple more videos that are really focused on some of these questions you guys are asking, because uh, I know we can't get through all of them. Um, but I mean, th these are, are, are great, great questions. So uh, yeah, I, I want to make sure we can answer everything. And so we'll have to do like a follow up, maybe we'll have to do a part two of this, uh, Deanna. And yeah, and then very last thing, uh, we are actively hiring. Uh, so if you do go to, if you are uh, you know, interested in working on mobile apps uh, for a living, all we do is mobile. And uh, we also are now getting into game development as well as part of that. Um, so you can go to openforge.io and it is slash opportunities, I believe. Yeah, let me just see here, opportunities. Let's see. I believe that's it. Yep, that is it, right? And so uh, we are currently hiring for uh, development roles, design roles, and quality assurance roles. Uh, so yeah, that definitely uh, join on in there. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that is the last slide. So thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Uh, feel free to reach out again to us directly. Uh, it is ricardo at openforge.io, jedi at openforge.io. Uh, you know, happy to answer any questions uh, and help you guys however we can. Uh, can't do this without you. You know, it's uh, a lot more fun to do this together. So thank you guys so much. And Deanna, anything else from your side? Or yeah, thank or you so much, everybody. We're closing out here today. So many questions, like Jedi said, but we're honestly super happy and stoked about the level of engagement. We hope that you all enjoyed it. And for those of you that stayed until the end, um, just a little bit of a preview, I guess. Jedi, Jedi and his team will be joining us again next month. So be on the lookout for that. We're going to have another great and amazing presentation from our trusted partners and friends at Open Forge. So be on the lookout for that invitation and for that registration information. But as he said, if you are curious about a recording, access to slides, anything like that, that will be in a follow-up email coming at you today. So thank you so much to Jedi and Ricardo, and I hope that everyone has a great rest of your day.